What I want to do to start with is to take those things that the Department of Energy and Climate Change doesn't include within their costs of policy, identify what they are, and then translate that in the final part of my talk into calculations about how much policies are increasing the costs of both gas and electricity, but I'm primarily concerned with electricity. So, let me start first of all with power generation. Now, we all have heard how wind supplies are intermittent, how they um, impinge on the reliability of the system, on the margins that are available, and the importance of having backup. Let's look at this from the point of view of an investor, and thus what we have to do in order to provide that the wind system is stable in terms of providing both industry and consumers with electricity. Let's start with stepping back, and stepping back from the point of view of the conventional, though not very good, calculation of the cost of alternative sources of generation. Uh, this is an updated version of standard calculations of what are called levelized costs, which are used to identify what the cheapest sources of electricity are. The cheapest, if we had no policy intervention, is the one that's highlighted in yellow. It's combined cycle gas um, uh, plants, which run at a cost of about 60 odd pounds per megawatt hour, um, taking out all of the um, add-ons in terms of the carbon floor price and so forth, that you've already heard about. The next best alternative that is free of the costs of um, carbon because of low carbon generation is nuclear power whose costs run at somewhere around 50 to 60 pounds also per tonne in the long, sorry, per megawatt hour of electricity in the long run. It's a lot more expensive now, largely because we're starting on a new generation of nuclear reactors with uncertain safety requirements and very little knowledge about how much it's going to cost to build them. So the strike price that's been agreed, which is much higher, is driven by this uncertainty and is driven partly by the fact that the interventions that have been made in the electricity market have increased the rate of return that investors require. However, as an alternative, what we are actually building at the moment is these things highlighted in purple. That is to say, a combination of um, onshore and offshore wind, some biomass, and the need to have backup, which is costing around the same amount. And all of these together imply that we're roughly speaking investing at a cost that is double what either nuclear or combined cycle gas would be in the longer term. Now, the second thing that an investor has to worry about is how do they get their money back? Because apart from plants like nuclear plants which have been guaranteed a price, you get it back by earning the market price which will, for much of the time, not do more than cover your variable costs of operation, but for small numbers of hours in the year, will command a higher price, and that higher price is what covers the capital costs and the other fixed costs that you have to recover. And those higher prices are mainly made, earned, during peak periods in the winter time, and in particular, during the few hours of winter period when demand is highest, it's particularly, in fact, in the early evening, late afternoon, early evening hours, it's to a, some extent during the morning period and during the day. But the big money is made in a few hours in the year, which is essentially when prices spike above the variable costs of supply. Now, one of the things that wind does is that wind changes those prices because the wind means that there's lots of generation available and that brings down the average price. 
And what you see from this diagram is that the average price earned by wind is actually lower than the average price earned by other plants. So wind is actually less valuable because when it's producing, prices are low, and on the other hand, when it's not producing, prices are high. Now that has two effects. It undermines the return on capital that investors can make, and secondly, it means that wind generators actually don't get a decent price any more than anybody else does when they're generating. In order to make up for the difference between the prices that prevail when wind is available and wind isn't available, we have to have, as we've already heard, backup. And these two curves show what was the amount of spare gas capacity for different periods of time in 2011-12, and what will be required in 2020 if we had exactly the same pattern of wind generation, but we have much more wind capacity. The point here is a simple one, but it's a very important one. In order to back up wind, we need, by 2020, to have somewhere between 20,000 megawatts, 20 gigawatts of wind capacity, and up to nearly 40 available doing literally nothing for most of the time. In other words, that somebody has to pay for providing that 20 to 40 gigawatts of capacity to sit there just for the small number of hours that they're required in the year. Now, how is that to be done? Well, you heard reference to the capacity mechanism that is being introduced under the new reforms. That is going to be paid for by charges that all of us will pay to pay people to invest in unused capacity. In effect, rather than being paid for generating electricity, they're being paid to be available in case the wind isn't blowing. And the costs of doing that are quite substantial and are not taken into account in the Department of Energy and Climate Change costs of what are the costs of policy, policy interventions. Now, Overall, the consequences of that will be, and there are different ways of doing the sums, but by my estimate, it will add of the order of 10 to 15 pounds per megawatt hour to provide the spare capacity that's required as backup for the system when we have moved to a system from one now where we have about eight gigawatts of wind to one in 2020 where the current figures as you've seen are somewhere between 28 and 30 gigawatts in other words roughly speaking trebling the amount of wind um, on the system it is at the moment not viable to produce um, to invest in new plants which burn gas the only attractive things, as we've also heard in, is to invest in plants which build, burn coal. Um, Germany is doing that. There's a very strong reluctance to do that in the UK. But the consequence of that reluctance is essentially that we will find ourselves paying for these very lar large spare capacity to provide for the margin required at the times when the wind is not available. Now, let me move on to a second area that the department doesn't look at, and that is, do wind plants actually perform in the way that they assume? The current assumption is that a wind farm brought into operation will have a load factor over its life, fairly steadily, of about 26 to 27% if it's onshore, and somewhere of the order of 33 to 35% if it's offshore. Now, as you may know, I've done some work which looks at what the historic performance of wind farms has been over their life, and I produced the following curve that's illustrated there based on an analysis that was published late last year which showed that essentially they start somewhere below, above that average, somewhere around 27, 28 percent, 
and then gradually it goes down, and it goes down to probably no better than 15% when they get 15 years old or longer. The margins of that decline are quite large. Some have that lower dotted line and are much worse. Some of them are significantly better for onshore wind farms, but still the average is that very substantial decline. Now, that decline turns out to be higher for big wind farms than for small wind farms. In other words, ones where there are small amounts of capacity seem to uh, decline less rapidly than ones where there are large amounts of capacity. And that's an experience that's been borne out in Denmark. Denmark has a lot of very small wind farms which are well maintained, well sited, and prove relatively more reliable, but even in Denmark, their performance gets worse over time. The big ones, which is the direction that we have been going in the UK, the fall off is considerably faster, and the overall levels of performance over their lifetime are significantly worse. It's also often suggested that, oh well, that's a problem of the past. It's a problem of old technology, of small turbines, which are being replaced by newer, bigger, and better ones. Well, there's a little bit of comfort to take from that. This diagram shows the different performance of the smallest at the bottom, middle-sized ones in the middle, and big ones at the top. But what you see is that after you get to about eight years or 10 years, there's very little difference between them. In other words, that essentially they may be better to begin with, but they are not better over their lifetime when we look at them at 10 or 12 years old. The consequence of all of this is that by the time we get to 2020, the average load factor for wind farms onshore in the UK is likely to have fallen to somewhere of the order of 20% down from the assumption of about 26% that I said was built in to DEX calculations. In other words, that if you take account of realistic, realized performance, not the theory, but the actual performance, then we are going to be dealing with wind farms where in order to generate the level of output that we have been planning for, you actually need something of the order of 25 to 33% more capacity simply to produce a standard level of output. And the situation in a sense gets worse because the more you build, the more you have a larger and older fleet of wind farms and so you have to make up for that and so on. So essentially the gains from building more wind capacity turn out to be surprisingly low in terms of renewables out output. Now there's another factor that's part of those same calculations that I skipped and that is that wind farms overall <coughs> in the UK have been getting worse. They've been getting worse because the newer ones are built in worse locations. When they first built them, they built them in locations that they knew to be windy, that they uh, sighted the turbines quite carefully, and essentially they were performing relatively well. But as we get more and more wind farms, they get worse because we have worse sites, they're actually putting the turbines closer together, and the overall performance is deteriorating because of um, the pressure to find sites and the difficulty of developing new sites. Consequences, therefore, are that actually building new wind farms is not a very good deal. It's a deal that's been progressively getting worse over time, and essentially, a wind farm as an investment today is good for 10 years, so-so for the next five years, and hopeless after 15 years. And in effect, the pattern that we will be seeing, which we actually are seeing, is essentially a phenomenon by which a new wind farm built today will have a life of somewhere between 10 and 15 years, and then 
there will be repowering. They will come back and they will say, what we want to do is to put new turbines, bigger turbines, perhaps fewer of them in the same place. So the story that a new wind farm is for 25 years, nonsense. It isn't true. And it isn't going to be true in future. A new wind farm is probably for 15 years maximum, and then there will be a back for essentially a bigger one, which will, they hope, provide more output or more reliable output. Now, all of this means that the investment in wind farms is earning a lower return than people had expected and will continue low, earning a lower return. And in order to break even, you actually have to have significantly higher prices than the classic calculations. And these figures here show two sets of calculations. At the lower part of the graph, it shows the calculations that DEC made for 2017, they, this was last year, at the levelized cost of um, prices from a variety of sources. And in particular, the argument was that that £88 for gas and £86 for wind was wind competitive with gas. Well, that's on their assumptions. If you strip out their assumptions and you actually apply the actual performance, the cost still is £88 on their calculations for gas, but it's now £180 for wind onshore and is arguably a lot worse than that on offshore. In other words, wind is actually a lot more expensive. And that's not all of the costs that Jeremy referred to. Balancing, transmission, those are all on top. Just on its own, wind is more expensive if you're really going to make a decent return out of it. Right, now the implications for energy prices. The thing that is in the newspapers practically every day. So, let me turn to history, because it matters. Up until 2005, the price of energy in the UK, in terms of what was being paid by consumers, didn't really rise very much, and it certainly didn't rise faster than the general rate of inflation. In 2005, everything changed. And from 2005 to 2012, in particular, gas prices went up quite rapidly, that affected household bills, both through the gas component of the bill and because underlying the wholesale market price is essentially the price of gas. The wholesale market price most of the time is driven by the price of gas. Why did the gas price go up? Because the UK stopped being an exporter of gas. We switched from being able to export gas to importing gas, and we switched in 2005. And the crucial underlying economic factor has been this transition from being an exporter to being an importer of gas, and that is essentially a one-off change. There was a one-off change in the state of the market, which was then exacerbated by the international market, which oil prices went up, and in Europe, oil prices are indexed to, uh, I'm sorry, gas prices are indexed to oil prices, and so essentially gas prices in Europe went up because of oil prices. But those were changes, as I emphasized, that are once off. They are not changes that will go on happening. And practically everything that is the story that we are given by DEC is essentially a story that makes sense if we believe that gas prices are going to go on going up at this kind of rate in future. Now actually, in, in terms of the wholesale price of gas, it peaked in 2008. And even now, it is lower than the 2008 price by a small margin. So essentially, the story of never-ending gas price increases is not correct. And if you strip that out, we then find that the real problem that we face from policy is not gas. Forget it. It's irrelevant in terms of future energy bills. The effects are small. There will be a small effect from that side. It's on electricity. And almost everything that I'm going to talk about is looked at from the perspective of electricity. Now, 
If you take Deck's own figures, their, their figures, they show that in the low price scenario, which is the one that I believe is most likely to be representative, that electricity prices up to 2020 will go up by policy, changes as about 44%, um, and business ones will go up by about 74%, again in that scenario. Now, that is a scenario which leaves out quite a number of elements of what policy is doing. The major ones is that they don't allocate the costs of policy correctly. And secondly, they don't take account of the impacts that I've been talking about in terms of the need to incentivize new investment and the need to take account of the degradation in the performance of wind farms. So if we were to deal with those, we would finish up with a rather higher policy element in terms of the increases on DEC's own view. But there is another problem, and this is a more subtle but much more important problem. We don't just pay for higher energy prices in the form of our energy bills. We pay them in the form of everything that we consume. We pay for them in the income that we earn and then the taxes that we have to pay because our taxes have to pay for the energy bills paid for by schools and hospitals and all government institutions. At the same time, our incomes are affected because if Jeremy's businesses are unable to um, afford higher energy costs, they will eventually have to lower the wages that they pay. So our wages will be lower or there will be less employment or there will be employment in sectors that pay less money. All of these things feed through to the total impact on our welfare of higher energy prices. And none of those are captured by focusing on energy bills directly. So I divide the benefit, I'm sorry, the costs of um, energy policies into two categories. The direct costs that we see in our energy bills and the indirect costs that affect us through our general cost of living, through our incomes and through the taxes that we pay. If you look at those, the prices passed through from policy look much, much bigger. Starting first of all with merely taking Dex own figures, but doing a minor reallocation to take account of the costs of building transmission, the costs of balancing services, and a variety of other things. And those costs are well understood. They're not agreed, but they're ranges that are regarded as reasonable by those people who specialize in those things. So I've just simply used those figures um, to readjust Dex own figures and you see the direct impact on energy bills is about an increase of 64%. But now, according to two different sets of assumptions, you have, if you take the total effect, an increase of about 230%. In other words, the bills, the total impact is about three times the current one. Now, that looks at everything. That looks at the effect on incomes, it looks at the effect on um, taxes and the like. Suppose we simply took out that and we only worried about those things which are passed on in prices, in the cost of living as we worry about. Then in that case, the increase is about 113% or about double the direct effect. So in other words, that just through prices, we have more than a doubling of the impact on our well-being, on our cost of living. If you make a further adjustment to allow for the degradation in the performance of wind farms, to allow for the costs of contracting additional spare capacity and so forth, the numbers go up. It goes up to about an 87% direct increase and um, a partial one, that's prices alone of about 150% and a full effect, taking everything into account, 
of 300%. In other words, that the cost is four times the current level of people's spending on electricity. Now, to show those figures, the final graph that I have here is the standard deck electricity bill is £425 a year, based on what they regard as the average level of electricity consumption. That, when you take everything into account, simply by reallocating their policy costs, you finish up at increasing to nearly £1,400. So from £400 to £1,400, taking all of the effects into account, if you make the further adjustment for the items I've talked about, you finish up going from £400 to around £1,700 in total. In other words, the direct effect is only a small part of the story. When you look at the complete effect, you're talking about increases that vary from 900-ish at the low end up to £1,300 at the high end. Now, by anybody's standards, that's a lot to pay. That, you have to remember, comes out of um, a household general level of income of perhaps £30,000 a year after taxes. So, you are paying a large amount of income to pay for the costs of the levies, green programs and all of the rest. And as we've already heard, the majority of that is linked to, is driven by renewables. Actually, um, probably 75% of that total comes from a commitment to renewables. This is just an enormously expensive way that all of us are paying for. We pay for not just in the form of our lower our electricity bills or our gas bills. Those, in some sense, we could do something about, but you can't do anything about the cost of all of the rest. You can't do anything about what it costs to run schools and hospitals. Those are things where the impact is unavoidable, but much larger than the direct impact. So, in summary, the pattern of the emphasis on relying on wind is that we are going to finish up with needing to have a great deal of power generating capacity that will sit there doing nothing. That we have to pay for that and we have to pay for the degradation in the performance of the wind plants that are built. And paying for it is going to cost somewhere of the order of 1400 to 1700 pounds a year. Thank you.